I've grouped all the Act 1 bosses into one video and I will group all the Act 2 bosses into one as well. Tyrian or more likely Tyrian but given how oppressive he is I'm sticking to my pronunciation is quite the interesting fellow. In this video I want to go a little in depth on my thoughts on this guy and why he matters but to get there we first need to talk about what he is and how the fight plays out. As you might know less important bosses often have sad patterns. This guy was the reason I found out about it in the first place because it is so unbelievably simple. The alternates between taking 2 and 1 action per turn starting with 2 and the attacks he chooses follow this script. You can shorten it to only 5 moves if you consider that he alternate between greatsword guard and the doppelganger. The doppelganger is even easier, he attacks, then he will either use Kazepo Umfil, either way he will increase the physical damage dealt by Tyrant and then he will lash out. If left uninterrupted on the second action of the second summon the doppelganger is always going to activate a pep power. He has two pep powers and while you should always block there's a chance for him to use Kozaml on Henbig which just straight up does nothing. You can't rely on it obviously but it helps when it happens. With his attack or crash you can target either the Luminary or Hendrik. Zamel however always targets the main character. When he runs out of MP he will attempt to use Zamel once then skip it entirely which also means that he will summon the shadow much more quickly. If he already has a shadow active however he will skip over it. So sometimes waiting a cycle to kill it might just be worth it because it will result in more downtime. The Japanese wiki wiki says that he will skip over greatsword guard when it isn't needed. I'm not sure whether this is google translate acting up but it is nonetheless untrue. An issue you're bound to run into is that he has pretty low agility but there's still always a chance for him to go before or after you so you can never get comfortable. The doppelganger on the other hand has much more agility so he usually outspeeds you. If you're for example only killing it in 2 hits which is very likely then you can only kill it before it gets umpel off in the case that Tyrion outsped you on the turn before because then you will get an extra attack before the shadow ever gets to act. On stronger enemy however you don't even reliably kill it with 2 giga slashes. This means killing the phantom quickly doesn't give you a big reward for the huge risk you're taking so if you didn't get outsped by Tyrion or you are so high level that you're outspeeding the phantom it might just be advisable to play super slow instead. Kezab is much less worrying than Umfil, it basically does nothing, sometimes it straight up misses and if you're playing with no armor it literally does nothing. Sometimes though there's nothing you can do and the Phantom will get an Umfil out and from there on it's even more RNG and Tyrion might just kill you despite any of your efforts. Tyrion has a parry chance and decently high defense. It makes it so that unless you're at a pretty high level, you're not going to do that much damage with great swords. You can't lower his defense or raise your own attack either. Giga Slash on the other hand has a lot of things working for out here. If you're at level 21 or slightly below while using skill seeds then you will have it and in that case Giga Slash not only does zap damage which Tyrion is weak against so you do 25% bonus damage. But you can craft a sword that does 30% more bonus damage to undead which applies when using Giga Slash. These bonuses are multiplicative and to top it off Giga Slash ignores the parry chance and it hits the doppelganger as well when he summons it. So Giga Slash is the best damage option for a certain level range. If you struggle really badly and go up to a high level then Unbridled Blade outperforms it. But more importantly what do you do if you're below level 21? Oh. Trust me we'll get to that. But for now we still haven't even talked about one part of the equation. That's because you're not fighting this boss by yourself. You have an AI controlled and immortal helper. Hendrix's forbearance is just a huge ONG. Kabaf is good if you're playing with armor, without it does nothing. Attacks on the phantom can help if you can two shot them without. But you mostly pray for forbearance. He also uses mid heal when your HP is around half. He will also use MP healing items when your MP is low so those things are mostly predictable. I say mostly because he sometimes does weird stuff when he uses multiple support abilities in a row. So sometimes he won't heal after casting Kabuff on the turn before and just attack or he'll prioritize Kabuff or using magic water. 
As long as you keep that in mind, you can manipulate heals from Hendrick if you equip or unequip items that increase max HP or MP, since he looks at your percent left. On the same note, since you can entirely predict what Tyrant is going to do, it is possible to, for example, equip things that make you take more damage than you would usually take in order to force a heal from Hendrick. It is, however, random whether or not he outspeeds Tyrant, so his heals can happen right after you get hit or before. He usually ends up never healing because you die before he gets his action, but that's besides the point. Whether or not you're playing on harder enemies, he does very little damage if he does decide to attack and you want to minimize those actions as much as possible. He also does much less damage on harder enemies, but it's not good either way. With all that in mind, there's many actions you want to take into consideration that aren't just the highest damage. Consumables are absolutely vital, so Panacea, Sage's Elixir, Walkbound Shards, maybe even Yggdrasil Dew, which can technically be farmed in Act 1 if you want to wait for, I think, 4 hours for the one to respawn. Those not being real time but in game hours, which is a very questionable design decision in my opinion. Sadly, a lot of the Luminary specific abilities don't work here. For example, I can't recommend any of the parry chance moves. You're the only one doing good damage here and slow playing overall makes this less reliable for my testing. And Zamil can't even be parried. I can't recommend sleep either because not only does he have a good resistance against it, Hendrik will wake him up with his regular attacks. This is the one fight where the defense command is at its peak though. You not only need to defend on certain turns, depending on your level and draconian quests, for example on turn 3, you might not be able to survive a lash plus Zamil from full HP, so you need to defend. There's also no variance in whether or not he targets you with the Zamil or lash. The problem with that, however, is when Hendrik outspeeds on the turn before and then Tyrion targets you with a regular attack, there's no way to reliably survive. The situation is that you're damaged and if you block he's just gonna kill you through the defense and if you heal he's gonna kill you from full HP. The only hope is to defend and hope that Hendrik outspeeds and uses Mithil on you while you defend. The luminary spells are also kinda useless, even if fire technically does extra damage. At higher levels more heal might have some value and that's all your abilities. There is however a bit more you can do on your actions. Switching equipment is highly useful. Depending on what you have, you can raise your dark resistance on turns where you know a Zamil is gonna happen, or you can manipulate your agility for many purposes. You can manipulate Hendrik and you can increase your own damage if you need to guarantee a kill on the shadow. And if you need to slow play it because you want to wait out a cycle of summoning before you kill the shadow, then going all in on defense is the play. So to summarize, agility rolls can lose you the fight, Damage rolling low can screw you over on harder enemies when a shadow doesn't die to 2 giga slashes. Umfil Tyrant can absolutely ruin your day, like killing you outright despite defending. And Hendrik can just not do his job and for example use Kabaf, which especially when you're playing with no armor, literally does nothing. And the guy has 2000 plus HP without stronger enemies. The fight takes ages and so much can go wrong. You don't need anything lucky to happen like getting a crit or low percent sleep, but you need to not get screwed over by RNG for an ungodly amount of time here. If you at least had so little agility that you were guaranteed to go before him, this wouldn't be so bad and if the shadow didn't have just enough HP to sometimes survive 2 giga slashes, it also would be so bad, but even in that hypothetical, this fight would still be terrible. But how is this so awful? This seems like I've just given you the blueprints to beat this guy, and you just need to apply it. But most of the time, this isn't gonna be enough. And yes, every fight is RNG dependent at lower levels. Furthermore, how unlikely you are to win depends on your level, and that's not different from anything else in this game, right? I believe that not only is Tyrion the worst boss here, he also happens to be the worst part about this game and what crushes its replayability. He is the epitome of the bad design in this game. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. To truly understand the smelliness of this absolute turd, I want to talk about this game's design for a moment. Traditionally, Dragon Quest has always given you all your party members early on and you're expected to raise them up by grinding. 
If we look at the first 9 games of the series, we get 3 categories of games. There's the ones where you get all your party members within the first few hours of play. To better make my point, I'm grouping Dragon Quest 4 and Dragon Quest 9 in here, even if they're a bit more nuanced. Then there's Dragon Quest 5 where you can recruit monsters at any point, but their strength depends on your own. At lower levels you won't be able to recruit any of the monsters that are worthwhile without leveling them first. So while you're raising your own level, the monsters available to you also increase. And finally, we have the games where new characters join you throughout. Dragon Quest 6 and Dragon Quest 7 have one thing in common though. They have a vocation system in place that allows you to treat any character as almost a blank slate. And getting a new character amounts to another build to try out. Especially in Dragon Quest 7, the new characters are never on par with who you already have. And Dragon Quest 6 does have a few characters join you at competent levels, but I believe that is the outlier and not the norm for the series. So in short, Dragon Quest 11 is different. It's split into two acts and the drip feeds you, you party members, twice. Once in Act 1 and then again here in Act 2 where you have an empty party and slowly have to expand it once more. If I was to make a chart with boss fights and the amount of party members available to you for each, it would look something like this. Well, in actuality, it would look more like this. The first chart was just the amount of party members you have with you at that point in the game, not who participates in the boss fights. The game not only keeps giving you new party members, it also takes them away from you every now and then. I think it's good game design when in the first Jasper fight, right after you get your fifth party member, the game takes Eric away for just this one fight, so you have to give Silvando a shot. In that sense, it's impossible to never try him out. I think the devs needed everyone to join at high base levels. On my first playthrough, I played very casually, just grinding when I got stuck and felt underleveled, like I did in the old Dragon Quest games. But whenever someone new joined the party, there would be many levels above everyone else. And I think that's intentional because the devs want you to experiment with and have used everyone by the end of Act 1. Not only because it aids the gameplay, but it makes the story more impactful if you at least at some point had a use for everyone. Finding them again in Act 2 and upgrading them even farther wouldn't be impactful at all if you never used them after all. However, this is where the game runs into another problem. Dragon Quest games have always catered to everyone. You can make them as easy or hard as you want. If you don't grind a lot, then the game is gonna be much harder. If you level up a few times, you are guaranteed to eventually get past whatever boss you were stuck on. I think this applies to all Dragon Quest games and playing for example Dragon Quest 4 or Dragon Quest 8 while only fighting the monsters you happen to encounter with random battles is a really interesting and deeply strategic experience. This game however doesn't have random battles. In Dragon Quest XI you can skip past every monster you want and be at super low levels. And with how free form the combat system is, you can get past pretty much everything with just the levels your party members have inherently. And I really do think levels are at the high end of what's expected at that point. Silvando for example joins only one fight after the sisters and he is 3 levels higher. And then only after 2 more bosses, Jasper and the spider, Rap and Jade join at level 23. At least in my opinion this 8 level jump is way higher than what I normally achieve. So if you explore everything and fight a good amount of enemies you will reach that level. The problem however is that in the old Dragon Quest games, players were able to challenge themselves by keeping their levels low. Now with the levels of the new party members being so high, what challenge is left? Because getting through Act 1 and later on Act 2 with the levels that that part of the game gives you is an absolute joke. I can't say whether this is the intention behind it, but Draconian quests seem like the perfect solution. The game no longer requires grinding for all skill levels to just get through the game, but if you still want to challenge yourself, you can use Draconian quests and suddenly the levels of the new party members don't seem so ridiculously high anymore. In a vacuum, this would make Dragon Quest XI such a great game. I think allowing all kinds of playstyles is great and adds so much value. You can seamlessly finish one playthrough and start another one with extra restrictions where you challenge yourself a bit. And replaying this game is fun. You move fast, you don't have random encounters to worry about, you don't need to grind. 
If you ever do get stuck on a boss, you don't even need to grind, you can simply reallocate your skills, try a different strategy very easily, or you can even start the battle with a pet power which can swing it in your favor. The game is pretty linear, but if the combat is the main focus, it's good to have a tightly designed difficulty curve. Replaying this game is starting to sound fun, right? This however is where we run into a bit of an issue. If you remember that graph from a few minutes ago that I showed you for seemingly no reason, there's two very noticeable dips. In Act 1 there's two fights that aren't really fights, they're set pieces. The game strips you of your party members and you're supposed to fight something with just the luminary and nobody else. There is still a lot you can do, but it's easy to see how stripping you down to only one party member inherently dumps down the game by a lot. But having a story moment you realized through the combat system is neat, plenty of games do that. Even here, the scene at the end of Act 1 where you fight an invincible Jasper is really cool. There's also the one with the guards in Gondolia where it doesn't matter what the outcome is or the first part of Eric vs Indignus where you fight a couple of mobs. These are all fights that you're either meant to lose or if you do lose, you still get to progress through the game. And there's plenty of examples like Jade or Web's interludes in the definitive edition of this game. There's also that one scene where you beat up Vince after he turned Nelly, but in that one it's literally impossible to lose. The difference here is that they wanted a few of these story sections to feel tense, like you're really overcoming the odds and beating an opponent. But how do you make basically a cutscene feel real? Well, you make it real. So these are fights that not only take away all your options, they are also difficult enough to make the average player feel challenged. And this is where the high expected levels suddenly become a bit of an issue. Using strategy can make up for so much in this game. There's even pep powers if you're really stuck on a boss, if you have party members. There's items like Yggdrasilis from the casino, which for the record are also useless in the 1v1 fights. And by reallocating your skill points you are so flexible and can do so much, you can know what you're facing and adjust accordingly. Overall I think that if EXP gain was straight up disabled, you would still be able to beat most of the content in this game. Even with Draconian quests it wouldn't be too terrible. The reasons I say most are because of early game and because of these luminary only fights. They are such a high hurdle to jump and you're met with a choice. You either grind levels which in turn will make the rest of the act way too easy or you keep trying until you get lucky enough. Sadly the second is what I end up going for in most challenge runs but it really sucks to be forced into that situation in the first place. With no armor specifically it becomes mind numbing because there's nothing to do except retry and get lucky or grind. Especially when nothing else in this game before or after requires nearly as many raw stats. If you do decide to grind not only does it take time, you also become stronger so the rest of the act is gonna be less fun. If those fights didn't exist it would be smooth sailing all the way through. The two fights I've been alluding to are the arena and Yermon. Even if the arena is technically many fights, I am still counting it as one. There are however a few saving graces. In the arena fight, most enemies use single target attacks and you have an invincible AI control teammate. When enemies target him, they waste their actions, so with enough luck, you will get past anything. It helps that you can retry those fights without being sent back to the last save. Plus, none of the fights take that long, so getting a sleep walk, even if they resist it, which might take a few tries, is gonna win you the fight by itself. It helps even more that if they're proving to be too hard, you can explore other areas because the boat gets available right before. You can go to later areas and get stronger equipment or you can even go to the casino and get super strong equipment to steamroll at even low levels. The lowest I've cleared the arena at is level 12 and at the end of it, it took me multiple hours of attempts but it ultimately wasn't terrible. The second fight is Jörmund. You fight him by yourself and while he is later in act 1, he is also quite a lot stronger. While most of the arena fights were practically over after you managed to kill one of the opponents, meaning after you dealt around 300 damage, this guy has a total of 820 HP at base 
and the luminary also does get a helper this time. The upside is that he can be easily put to sleep and waste a third of his actions buffing. Plus his high HP doesn't take as long as it seems either, given how he reduces his own defense. All his attacks can be parried, so there's plenty of things you can make use of to gain an advantage. It might require some RNG, but thankfully retwining him doesn't take too long, and it's a short fight. With good luck you can beat him at super low levels. Overall, these fights worsen the game, but they don't necessarily require grinding. They are however absurd difficulty spikes, need a needless amount of retwining, and all that because the game expects you to be at a much higher level than anything before or after. This is especially counterintuitive to draconian quests which are seemingly there to encourage players to challenge themselves. But now, if you're trying to play with them, and not what I assume can't be their purpose, just grind so much that the game has the same difficulty except you spend an extra amount of time grinding, now if you play with them you are punished by having to slog through attempt after attempt against these guys until you get lucky. On a side note, the draconian quest that makes enemies harder doesn't have a fixed bonus to everything. Each enemy gets its individual stat increase and thankfully the solo fights weren't buffed terribly much. They're annoying but ultimately you can do enough things to counteract that annoyance. So where was I going with this? The difference between these fights and High Wind is that the encounters we talked about are bearable. After Yermon you fight one more boss in the same questline as him, one filler battle and then immediately you have to face Tyreant. He has over 2000 HP, higher defense all while having a passive chance to parry most of your attacks, and he summons adds that take your attention away. He also acts more often and does more damage than Yermon, so you'll need to heal more. Your AI partner does like 40 damage, it takes so long. It takes really, really long and dying means having to redo all of it. By itself, this is already such a drag, but then he's also the biggest difficulty spike. Not just in this game, but I believe in the entire Dragon Quest series by a long shot. None of these solo fights are enjoyable, but at least the Headless Honcho for example only takes two lucky turns. Not having any control over a sequence of events that kills you for full HP is never gonna feel good, but having that happen 5 or 10 minutes into a fight straight up sucks. Remember when I said we'd later talk about what to do when you're below level 21 and can't get Giga Slash? Well, it would just suck to be you. There's really nothing you can do except grind. It's technically possible, I did beat this guy once at level 16, but that was an awful experience. I took more attempts on him in that one playthrough than I've taken on all other bosses in this game on all my playthroughs combined. I had never spent nearly as much time on a boss in a video game before. I do not recommend even attempting this guy before you have Giga Slash and after you get it, he suddenly becomes really easy. That's another case of shitty design in my opinion. But then there's this fight with Draconian quests which is even more awful. Your level just needs to be even higher. When a shadow lives, two giga slashes, that already sucks. No armor in this fight took my soul. But come on, nobody cares about challenging Dragon Quest games. The series is the video game equivalent to comfort food. They aren't intended to be made difficult. And it's not something new or bad that a boss requires you to grind. To that argument I just made up, I have to say, I am that nobody. There have been challenge ones and especially low level playthroughs of these games since very early days. And not only have Dragon Quest games always allowed for players to adjust the difficulty according to their needs, this game with its draconian quest seems to lean even farther into giving the players options to make a playthrough fun for themselves. I hope you're all on the same page that restricting someone for no good reason sucks, but this guy is a meaningless roadblock and a middle finger to anyone playing the game in an quote unquote unintended way. Although I find it hard to even call trying to not grind an excessive amount when you don't need to and maybe selecting some of the difficulty options unintended. Dragon Quest isn't about challenge, but I think the question what Dragon Quest is about not only doesn't have one answer, but these answers are highly individual and I think that's a big part of the appeal. The difference is that in the other games grinding was a norm, 
and I truly do believe that setting a level benchmark for only one fight, only to have every other boss beatable at lower levels, even the ones that come after, when this isn't expected or wanted in this game, is bad design. Tyriant isn't a product of lacking consideration for a certain type of player. This mess is going out of its way to ruin your day for playing the game in plenty of the many ways it can and wants to be played. So let me tell you about my experience with this boss for a moment. So in my very first casual playthrough of this game, I got stuck on this guy. I just went through the game at my own pace, had no issue with anything and when I reached him I died a few times. I didn't really die on anything else so it sucked but after a few attempts I got past him. Overall though it was a bad time. On my very first attempt I legit thought it was a scripted death like the guards in Gondolia and looking back on it the rest of the playthrough went smooth so my levels were definitely not too low and looking back at it my strats and equipment were fine. There was nothing added from having that difficulty spike there. I later played this game with all draconian quests and no armor as one of my first challenge runs. This was probably the most formative experience I've had with this game. Not only did I learn about boss patterns here, but I also found out how badly balanced the reduced EXP from weaker enemies is. I grinded on the vicious metal slimes that could appear alongside the crab enemies all the way until I hit level 49, but it still took me a bunch of attempts afterwards. Needless to say, everything before and after that point was an absolute cakewalk, but I spent more time here farming metal slimes than I spent in either Act 1 or the rest of Act 2. Overall an awful time. The game takes away your luminary skill tree, so the only attacking option in that playthrough where items and spells learned by level, as well as the barehanded sword dance. You would need to just equip any sword at all for Giga Slash, but I didn't because those were the rules and if I did the playthrough again, I would definitely cheat to get past him. Then later I did the aforementioned low level playthrough. That one was the worst experience I've had with video games to this day. And finally I later went on to do a modded playthrough where the player characters all have only one point of HP and I ended up grinding an absurd amount of strength seeds for this guy. He made me change my rules for the playthrough and nothing else in the playthrough required the seeds except for the Eric interlude but that's another kind of worms. You've seen the background footage and it's easy to imagine how much could have gone wrong in all of those clips. And all of that has at some point gone wrong and lost me that attempt. Behind those videos are thousands of readwise. If I was to do one of those playthroughs again, I would in every case cheat to get past the skeleton knockoff and it would vastly improve my experience. But what is he anyways? He single-handedly makes all the seemingly encouraged, given how there's draconian quests, self-imposed challenges an awful mess, even just playing normally. But he is nothing, he's literally not a character, he's not a real boss either. The cutscene where you first met him is also the last one where you see him and he is only present for the last 5% of it. The story is that something evil is in the old castle, you reluctantly team up with Hendrik, find out some stuff about Hendrik's past with Jasper, go into the throne room, meet Jasper, he has this whole monologue and then he dashes off and leaves you, except this guy spawns in, says two meaningless sentences about darkness I guess and how he's gonna fight you now and then he dies and is never mentioned again. Nobody even says his name, I don't know how to pronounce it because of it. Seriously, this guy is a reskin of a Dwenquist 10 boss. The guy is named after a color given how he's the guy that guards the purple orb. Really clever but that same orb was found in unguarded chest in act 1 by the way, which I was able to go back to those days. The guy doesn't even have a page on the .org wiki and on the fandom wiki it just says that he looks and sounds like Skeletor. He is so irrelevant and shocking. He could have been cut entirely and the game would be so much more playable. Do me a favor, whenever it is you're watching this video, look up Tyrion Dwayne Quest 11 or something and look at the top 10 or so results. 
there is no story discussion, no praise, nothing. It's just casual players getting stuck on him and looking for some advice. But guess what? There is no strategy that helps you here. Your numbers are simply too low. I can give you tips on every other boss, but this guy is simply too badly designed. If your stats are low, you're not gonna make it. It didn't really have to be that way. The cutscenes could have still ended with Jasper leaving, which by itself I do think makes sense given how he doesn't want to kill Hendrik, he wants Hendrik to think that he's been surpassed. But afterwards, how about finding the orb lying around, how about killing Tyrant in a cutscene, maybe make him not so terribly difficult, maybe, just maybe make Hendrik a party member for this. I can see that he wouldn't obey your commands at the very start since he's so reluctant to join you at all, but that could just last until after the Headless Horn show. I think that's about equivalent to the stretch before Eric joins you in Act 1 and if they wanted to mirror that, this would be it. And with Eric you have that whole part where it's just the two of you, but Hendrik never gets that moment. If Hendrik wasn't so useless, so if he was better as a helper, or if he was playable right now, this would be his time to shine. It would all have much more weight to it when he joins you. And as it is now, he joins you after Tyrant and doesn't participate in the next fight either because Web is another 1v1 set piece. That one is thankfully not hard because the numbers are set and another example of how this should go. But after that you already have another party member. You never feel like Kendrick is a driving force in your party. He never has that moment where he really carries you and him being playable for Tyrant would be just that. A big part about Hendrik's toolkit is that he can be very competent by himself. He can buff his own attacks, reduce enemy defense and all that while being a great physical damage dealer. But those abilities that would have really shined if you only had Hendrik available to you right now, they never get their moment in the spotlight. Right after Tyrion, you get Dweb who is great at reducing defense and Silvando who is great at buffing attack. In the two fights until then, he doesn't appear in one and he doesn't do well in the other. In the background you can see what the fight would look like with a base level Hendrik and it's actually more fun in my opinion. Even if he's not invincible, it's still much easier. He does absolutely stomp Tyrant, but in my opinion this would improve the game massively. For new players it's a chance to experiment and the fight would not only require more brain power, but it would never gatekeep a player out of making progress. It would still be remotely tense with Hendrik being able to die, if not more so, and for the more experienced players it would always be possible. Right now, what is Hendrik showing off right now? It's not his gameplay performance, it's an ability he doesn't even get until Act 3. Really, I don't know why they gave him 4 barons. If it is just to make the Tyrant and Headless Honcho fights easier, then they could have just not made those fights as hard. It doesn't show off what Hendrik is good at and it especially doesn't show off what he can even do because he can't use forbearance when he joins you. But at the end of the day this is just one of an infinite amount of ways to make this fight bearable. Maybe there could have been some weakness you can exploit to get past him. How about holy water dispelling the doppelgangers instantly? Or maybe they could have made rock bomb shards do double damage against him. There could have been something similar to the cannon in Lona Ludo that makes the tentacular fight so easy. And maybe it could have been like the Sylvando interlude and you have a few Heliodor guards accompany you. Just something, anything to bypass this fight if you don't want to do it. Because looking at online discourse, nobody wants to do this. You don't get pet powers with just one party member and you don't get lineup switching and the way you take actions doesn't matter. These partyless fights strip away everything that makes this game unique or fun. The others are bad, but Tyrant is awful. As I stated at the beginning, this guy is the Tyrant that oppresses every playthrough and forces you to grind levels. If you just get past him, you get more party members at the Act 2 levels and the whole game would require no grinding all the way through, only minimal grinding with draconian quests. Dragon Quest games have always only been as hard as you want them to be. 
but now with Tai we end, there's a point where you can still grind and control how easy that part is. But the rest of the game is gonna be way easier too. There is no longer a smooth difficulty curve that the players make for themselves by leveling as much as they see fit. There are a few sections where you are tracked on your war stats and you either grind, only for the next section to become insultingly easy again, or you stop playing. In a vacuum, stat requirements or difficulty spikes would be okay, but the requirements are never so high again. If you watch mine or anyone else's videos where it discusses the game's deep and intricate gameplay, this smelly little turd is always gonna loom over all the discussion. Because this game would be so well suited for challenge runs. It would be so suited for more casual but still strategic lower level playthroughs like all the games that came before, if and only if it wasn't for this guy. As it is now, the game is much worse with this guy existing and he doesn't add anything of value, neither in terms of gameplay nor in terms of story. I really don't like him. He's worse than the gameplay jank, the abusable mechanics, he's worse than the linearity, how you can't sail or fly wherever you want anymore, he's worse than the new look of a definitive edition. He's worse than the MIDI soundtrack in the original release, he's worse than whatever they ended up doing with Jade and he's even worse than Act 3. Tai Bient is the biggest blemish on this game.